Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, nahamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa siyyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah. Wa man yudlil, wa man yudlil falahadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد إن شاء الله continuing tonight with الشمائل المحمدية and إن شاء الله at the end the monthly quiz إن شاء الله uh, and we're going to be coming إن شاء الله upon some very interesting chapters about the character of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم especially when it comes to the humility humbleness of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم his تواضع the crying of the Prophet ﷺ and his manner in general. And as the Prophet ﷺ, as Allah said in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You had him, the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, a good, the best example. So our intention, inshaAllah, just to refocus why we're sitting here and why we're listening is a ta'assi, to begin to follow the Prophet ﷺ more seriously, more sincerely. So when you're going to come and hear some of his akhlaq, the idea here is not just only to know more about him وسلم, but then start saying to yourself, uh, I want to start doing what the Prophet وسلم, used to do. So this chapter, before we reach these chapters, this is a chapter about the Qira'atu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the recitation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his recitation of the Qur'an. And uh, the first hadith I want to read, though it is weak, Sheikh al Albani said that it is weak, though I want to share it with you. And you can share weak a hadith as long as um, you tell people that they are weak, not very weak, they do not contradict another authentic hadith or general principle in Islam. So with these uh, conditions, you can share a weak hadith. People already know, if you tell them, well, it's weak, they already know it's weak. It doesn't have anything wrong in it, but there is some benefit in it. So there's nothing wrong with it, inshaAllah, with these conditions. So in this week's hadith, um, uh, Umm Salama radiallahu anha is asked about the reading of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did he recite the Qur'an? He said, She describes qira'atan mufassara. A comprehensible reading. مُقَطَّعَ حَرْفًا حَرْفًا Divided or slow, letter by letter. So, قِرَاءَ مُفَسَّرَ If you say, what is a مُفَسَّرَ? مُفَسَّرَ is from tafsir. What does مُفَسَّرَ mean? مُفَسَّرَ means that when he reads it صلى الله عليه وسلم and you're listening to it, or obviously he's listening to it, you're able to comprehend and understand what he's saying. So it's not so quick and so fast that you can't hear the words, you cannot even have time to ponder their meaning. No, mufassara, meaning when he's reading it, he leaves time for himself and even for the listener to understand what he's saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and even to think about it. So we're not talking about a very, very, very slow qira'ah, no. But enough for you that when you're reading that qira'ah, you understand, comp- uh, comprehend, and react to it. Muqatta'a harfan harfa. Each letter is pronounced right. Each word is pronounced right. So it's give it its time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are other types of recitation where a person might be reciting to memorize the Qur'an or reciting to review his memorization of the Qur'an. Or sometimes he's reciting just to finish the Qur'an and that's permissible. But a, a qira'a, a recitation that is done at night and is done spe- specifically to learn from the Qur'an needs to be slow enough for you to understand what you're saying. And this is... Um, Let's say someone's confirmed by the next hadith, that hadith is authentic. Uh, Anas ibn Malik was asked, he said, how was the reading of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He says, kana yuqatti'u qira'ata. He used to pause when he's reading. Yuqatti'u qira'ata. Pause when he's reading. Yaqulu, so he explained. Give you an example. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thumma yaqaf, then he stops. Thumma yaqulu, then he says, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Then he stops. ثم يقف. وكان يقرأ ملك يوم الدين. Or Malik. Right? Depending on the narration. And he used to say, ملك يوم الدين. Another narration, ملك يوم الدين. 
So what Anas radiallahu anhu is saying here is that how did the Prophet ﷺ read the Qur'an? He finishes an ayah and stops. Finishes an ayah and stops. And does not usually, it's not reported from him وسلم, that he combines ayahs together in one breath. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm deen not all of them together. And that gives you time, right, to take your breath and it gives you time also to read and react to what you're reading. So if you read it, whether you are an Imam or by yourself, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm deen with one breath, you don't give yourself the time that you need to understand what you're saying and know that Allah Azza wa is responding to everything that you say. So the reading of the Prophet ﷺ and reading of Sunnah is once you finish an ayah, you stop. They say even if the ayah is connected in meaning to an ayah that follows. If there's some ayahs of the Qur'an, or you, when, if you pause on the ayah, there'll be like one word left in the next ayah that is connected to the first. They say don't connect it. Don't connect it. Stop at that ayah at its conclusion and start with the next ayah with the next breath. Right? So that's the proper way to read the Qur'an here according from the Prophet wasallam. And sometimes he said he would read wasallam Maliki Yawmiddin. And that is a qira'ah mutawatira. Right? Qira'ah that is from the Qur'an. You know this very well inshaAllah. Just like Maliki Yawmiddin. So you may hear the Imam without even necessarily reading the entire surah of Al-Fatiha and what follows is in Warsh al nafi Okay? Without that, he could actually say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, Iyaka Na'budu. And that's permissible. And then it tells you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do that. Now, if, if the Prophet is praying at night, that's the next question. Uh, Ashabi, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha was asked. Do you read loud in an audible fashion or do you keep it to yourself at night? So the, it's, this hadith tells us that the Prophet ﷺ did both. Did both. So she was asked, The Prophet ﷺ recitation, was it loud, mean loud enough that it's audible? I can hear it. Or Yusir, it's private right? to himself only. قالت, كل ذلك كان يفعل. He did both of these things. قد كان ربما أثر. Sometimes his recitation is private and sometimes it is audible. So the one, the tabi'ah who asked her, he says, الحمد لله الذي جعل في الأمر سعى. الحمد لله who had put ease in this matter. Right? It made it easy, not difficult. Why is it easy? You can do both. Yeah, sometimes, alhamdulillah, you have energy, you want you know, wake yourself up and... W- so you want to be a little louder, you can do it, and that is sunnah. And other times, you, have, you, you, you feel the need for more ikhlas, more, um, um, more quietude, you just want to speak to Allah Azza wa So, I mean, whether you feel this or you feel that, both of them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Right? So it's possible to do this and possible to do that. Um Muhani said, كنت أسمع قراءة النبي بالليل وأنا على عريشي. She said, Um Muhani, he says, I would hear the recitation of the Prophet ﷺ while I'm, I'm on my bed. So the Prophet is praying somewhere outside, and she is in her home, on her bed, and she said, I, sometimes I would hear his recitation. So sometimes it's loud enough that it would travel. Loud enough that it would travel, so someone else sleeping on their bed, they would hear what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. Now we're going to see another thing that the Prophet ﷺ did when reciting. He did this once. Uh, at least. So the Sahabi says, I saw the Prophet He says, I saw the Prophet on his camel the day of Al Fatih. And this Fatih could mean the opening of Mecca, or in fact, when the Prophet was returning from Mecca. With the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, because this is when Inna Fatihna Laka Fatha Mubina was revealed, Surah Al Fatih was revealed. And then they asked the Prophet, وسلم, is this a victory? They just had a treaty. Is this victory? And they felt in their hearts that somehow, you know, we were compromised. Our, our situation was compromised. We had the upper hand, and somehow we needed to compromise with them. Then Allah revealed, No, indeed, we have given you a clear, manifest victory. And that's why they asked him, is it a victory? And they said, he said, yes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So anyway, they saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his camel, reciting what? 
إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر so that Allah will forgive you ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر your previous and your future sins قال فقرأ ورجع so he read and he said ترجيع and this ترجيع is described not in, not in this narration but in another narration is described by a sahabi by saying a a a Meaning that the voice of the Prophet ﷺ would come and go, come and go, come and go. So, tarjiyah is to come back. So, as if the, the voice, it pauses and comes back, pauses and comes back. With that elongation, with the men. Uh, 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 something like that, right? So, he, just, he heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting it in this way. And that indicates a reaction from the Prophet ﷺ to the ayahs and happiness. Like you're really enjoying this. What is this saying to the Prophet? First, it's giving the Muslims and giving the Prophet ﷺ victory, clear victory. And that is a ni'mah from Allah Azza wa plus the ni'mah of forgiveness. So he's reading it and he's really reacting to it wasallam. So the Sahabi says, He says, if not the people, if I do it, would gather around me, I would repeat what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mimic that so that he would hear it. But he was afraid, radiallahu anhu, if I do it, that the people won't understand what is happening and they would gather and maybe it would be some fitna for them. He said, but otherwise I would do it to explain it to you. As I said uh, in another narration, he said what it is. A, a, a. Meaning, a, stop, a, stop, a, stop. Right? And if you hear some people in Adhan sometimes, they do that. When you elongate, huh? Uh, right when you elongate the mat and the voice uh, wavers, goes up and down, up and down, up and down. This is what it is. Inshallah, is that clear? Yeah. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Now, the last one in this chapter, Al Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu maqal. He says, "Kanat qira'atu nabiyyi yurba ma yasmaghu man fil hujra wa huwa fil bayt." He says the recitation of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Someone in the yard may hear him recite while he's in the house. Someone in the yard may hear him recite while he's in the house. So the bait means house. What is the hujra? Like in, in modern Arabic, hujra in, in our uh, usage, hujra would mean a room. So when you read it with that understanding, it doesn't make sense. But it doesn't mean a room. Bait is a house. Hujra is a yard that is fenced. That's why it's called a hujra. So it's outside the home, and it's, say, uh, it's uh, exposed, I mean, it's not covered, and it has a fence to it. So if a, the Prophet وسلم, at times, he's praying inside his home, if he's standing outside the house, in that yard, sometimes you could hear his recitations. So again, confirming that at times could be audible enough that a person could hear it, and at times it is not. Now, how is the condition? Or what was the condition when the Prophet ﷺ was praying? And also when he was reading the Qur'an ﷺ. And also, did he cry? So the next chapter is about Buka'un Nabi. The crying of the Prophet ﷺ. And it tells you here that there is nothing wrong with crying. Especially for men, right? Because some of us have felt, or you have come from cultures where men don't cry. No matter what happens, you don't cry. But then when you hear the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu they'll tell you crying is for women, right? But when, they, when you hear that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa cried, you understand that that comes from a merciful heart. And that there is nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. Whether you are reacting to the Qur'an or you're reacting to the affliction of other people, there is nothing, actually it's a sign of Iman. So this Sahabi, yes. No. It doesn't say anything about Now, so Zakallah here the brother is asking, saying, asking about saying Bismillah in the in the salah, whether it is audible enough or in someone's secret. So um, the madhab disagree about that. As obviously that's the reason why we're asking. So some madhabs they will say you say that loud, and other madhabs they say you do not say that loud. The accurate opinion and the stronger opinion, and it's not audible. Saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, it's not audible because they report that from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And from Abu Bakr and from Umar, radiallahu anhum, that when they used to pray jama'ah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not audible. Though it is said, right? 
It is said, but it's not loud enough that the people, all the people behind will hear it. It's not allowed, allowed as much as Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So the person when he starts, uh, if he's the Imam and he's going to recite, he will say, then Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, loud enough for the congregation to hear, but Bismillah is for himself. So they say that is the way that the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam prayed. But it's no reason for conflict. If there's another madhab, another person who's doing it the other way, still, still the Salah Alhamdulillah is valid, inshallah. Now, so this is uh, the first description of the crying of the Prophet Sallallahu This is in Salah. It says, أَتَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ يُصَلِّي uh, He came to the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet was praying. وَلِجَوْفِهِ أَزِيزٌ كَأَزِيزِ الْمِرْجَلِ مِنَ الْبُكَاءِ And his jawf, his chest. Jawf is cavity. That means his chest. So his chest has a sound like the sound of a boiling pot because of crying. Okay? And I'm not going to repeat that sound to you, but that if you go home, inshallah, or once you leave the masjid, think, try to uh, reproduce crying and you're holding it in. Okay? Not that you're crying, but you're holding it in. And if you do it, you'll notice that it sounds like a pot boiling. Huh? Right? Like that. So this is, I came to him and his chest had produced, it was producing this sound because he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was crying when he was uh, praying. So this is when he was reciting Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now he, we're going to see in the next hadith, now he's going to be crying when somebody else is reciting. And there's an additional benefit, at least one extra benefit to it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. This is one of the people who had collected, meaning memorized the Qur'an at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet had said, if you want to take the Qur'an as it was revealed, take it from some. And he named one of them is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So he was... Uh, let's call him a specialist, had excelled in the Qur'an. So, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِقْرَأْ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet ﷺ said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, recite, so I could hear. Recite, so I could hear. So what does Abdullah ibn Mas'ud say? He said, أَقْرَأُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَيْكَ أُنزِلِ He said, I recited for you, and it was revealed upon you, and it came from you to us, and I'm going to recite it to you, because the Prophet ﷺ wanted to hear it from him. So he says, He says, I love to hear it from someone else. Okay? So this tells you, before we go any further, inshallah, that there, the Qur'an, uh, sometimes when you read it, it's one experience. When you listen to it from someone else, it's a different experience. And the Prophet wasallam's sunnah tells you so. So sometimes, maybe, subhanAllah, you're reading the Qur'an, and your you know, level of um, iman or interaction with it, acceptance of what this is at one level. And maybe what you need at that moment is for you to go and listen to the Qur'an from the recitation of someone else. You'll gain more from it. And vice versa, some other times. So both of these ways are legitimate and actually sunnah ways of learning from the Qur'an and interacting and benefiting from it. Either you read it yourself, and that can induce crying, or and also you listen to it, and that can induce crying and increase iman. So, فَقَرَأْتُ سُورَةَ النِّسَاء So he, I read Surah An-Nisa. حَتَّى بَلَغْتُ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا And we brought you as a witness for all of them. Huh? The uh, beginning of the ayah, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى كُلِّ هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا عَلَى هَأُولَاءِ شَهِيدًا It says, the meaning of it is that Allah Azza wa Jalla says, how it will be when we bring from each ummah a witness. And that witness is their prophet. So each ummah, Allah Azza wa will extract for them their prophet who will be a witness for them or against them. And he says, and we will bring you as a witness for the witnesses to confirm their testimony and the truth and all of that. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard that, he started tearing up. And his uh, uh, tears started to flow on his cheeks Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why is that so, Allahu A'la? It's because of the gravity of that day. The gravity of that day, because he is visualizing, he is feeling the day when Allah Azza wa Jalla, that's the day of judgment. That's the day where Allah is angry, that's the day when Allah's you know, punishment is so near. And he's bringing all of these witnesses of what uh, that community did and did not do. What sin that they commit and what, how, uh, what obligation they neglected. So Allah is bringing all of the, his prophets to testify against 
their communities or need uh, for them. And then the Prophet ﷺ is also being brought as a witness. So the severity of that uh, day and the severity of that responsibility as well. And Allah Alam also what other thoughts could have gone through his uh, brain wasallam. That made him cry. That made him cry. Now we will see a reaction to the Prophet ﷺ witnessing a natural phenomenon, which is the eclipse. The eclipse. Of course we know that once this happens, a solar or a lunar eclipse, what are we supposed to do? There's a salah. Right? There's a salah. And in it there's a long recitation. It tells you here. It says, إِنْ كَسَفَتِ الشَّمْسُ يَوْمًا عَلَىٰ أَحْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ so they experienced at the time of the Prophet ﷺ a solar eclipse. فَقَامَ رَسُولُ الله. This is a description of his salah. فَقَامَ رَسُولُ الله. He stood to pray. حَتَّى لَمْ يَكُدْ يَأْلَمْ حَتَّى لَمْ يَكَدْ يَبْكَى Until we thought he's not going to go into ruku, meaning that his recitation is so long, he continued reciting, until we thought he's not going to go into ruku. This is it. ثُمَّ رَكَى Then he went into ruku. فَلَمْ يَكَدْ يَرْفَعُ رَأْسَهُ And we thought he's not going to raise his head out of ruku. Meaning ruku was what? Very long. The recitation was very long and the ruku was very long. Yeah, actually this is the sunnah of um, al-kusuf. ثُمَّ رَفَعَ رَأْسَهُ فَلَمْ يَكَدْ أَنْ يَسْجُدْ Then he raised his head and we thought he's not going to go into sujood. That's also very long. ثُمَّ سَجَدْ فَلَمْ يَكَدْ أَنْ يَرْفَعَ رَأْسَهُ Then he prostrated, sujood. And we thought he's not going to lift his head up from sujood. Then in that, when he sat down, we thought he's not going to go into sujood again. But then he went into sujood. And then we thought he's not going to raise his head again. So all of them, when he's doing it, is so long. Each one, you know, segment of this salah, they think that this is the end of it. And he's not going to come back to it. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ was breathing heavy and crying. يَنْفُخُ وَيَبْكِي وَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَلَمْ تَعِدْنِي أَلَّا تُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنَ فِيهِمْ رَبِّي أَلَمْ تَعِدَنِي أَلَّا تُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَيَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَنَحْنُ نَسْتَغْفِرُهُ He says, Ya Allah, and he's speaking to Allah Azza wa Jal. Ya Allah, did you not promise me that you're not going to punish, punish them while I'm among them? Ya Rabb, didn't you promise me that you're not going to punish them while they're asking for forgiveness? And we are asking for your forgiveness. So, when he prayed those two rak'as, that eclipse ended. Then the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he praised Allah Azza wa Jal, Hamid Allah, he thanked him and he praised him and he said, Indeed, the sun and the moon are two signs of the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. And they do not go through an eclipse because of someone's death or birth. فَإِذًا كَسَفَا But if you see an eclipse, فَفْزَعُوا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Rush to the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Prophet ﷺ was affirming an important fact here. Because previously, the people of Jahiliyyah, what did they think about an eclipse when they saw it? It's a sign. Sign that someone's great has passed away or someone great is being born. And it happened, and subhanAllah, that's a test. Allah Azza wa sometimes may test us. It happened that, who died at that time? Ibrahim, the son of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His son died. So some people said, it happened because of Ibrahim. The son went through an eclipse because of Ibrahim. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to indicate that none of that happens. These signs are not because of something, of someone who's born or someone who passes away. But there is an ayah from Allah Azza wa Jal. So when you see it, rush to the remembrance of Allah. And you can see how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فَجَعَلَ يَنْفُخُ وَيَبْكِي He's breathing heavy and he's crying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he feared that what? This could be a sign of ah, يعني, an impending punishment. A punishment that will come. Now, here's a question. Now, we may be able, actually we are, are able to predict eclipses. Sooner and lunar. Solar and lunar. Does that take away from that anticipation or anxiety or fear that we should feel? Should it take away? Our ability to predict is one thing. Right? Like it's going to happen, you know, at 1.30 on that day, you know, in that week. That's fine. We're able to predict. But does that tell you that nothing bad is going to happen after? 
Allah sends this as a reminder, as a cosmic reminder. That is, every day you see the sun and you see the moon, and you come to rely on their light and their movement. When that gets interrupted, and all of a sudden you lose sometimes the complete light of the sun, that should you know, push you to reflect that this is all in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. And what if, though it's predictable, what if this is happening to usher a punishment of Allah? What if this is happening actually to lead to a punishment of Allah? Do you know? We don't know. So even though it's predictable, you know, we do not call it just a natural phenomenon that's going to come and go. No, we understand as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught me, this is a sign. Huh? Uh, this is a sign. Even if it's predictable, it's a sign. An earthquake, even if it's predictable, it's a sign that Allah Azza wa Jal is sending to us. And that if you not rush back to the, uh, you know, the religion of Allah and the remembrance of Allah and asking Allah for forgiveness, that could be a sign that brings on the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal, either immediately after or later. So that doesn't take our ability to predict and analyze and understand it, doesn't take away from the fact that it's a sign. And when you see, just look at it, when you look at it and it's happening to you, you understand from it, Allah's power. And that Allah could take the light of this sun, and could take the light of that moon. And what else could happen to this earth if Allah Azza wa Jal is angry with us? So it's a reminder. It's a reminder. We shouldn't take it lightly. Now we're going to see the Prophet Sallallahu by shedding some tears when somebody passes away. Okay? And that then this again does not take away from uh, one's manhood or one's iman or one's taqwa or one's reliance upon Allah Azza wa So, أَخَذَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ بْنَةً لَهُ تَقْضِي فَاحْتَضَنَهَا فَوْضَعَهَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held a daughter and by daughter here it's meant a granddaughter. So had held a granddaughter of his that was dying and he hugged her and put her between his hands Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قَالَ فَمَاتَتْ وَهِيَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ so she passed away while she was in his uh, arms, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قَالَ وَصَاحَتْ أُمُّ أَيْمَنْ And Ummu Ayman, right, who was very close to the Prophet sallallahu and to his family, cried out loud when she saw this. Because right? she's part of the family. She cried out loud. فَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَتَبْكِينَ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Are you crying? In the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? And you'll understand what he meant here. فَقَالَتْ أَلَسْتُ أَرَاكَ تَبْكِي She said, I mean, I'm seeing you crying. I can see you crying as well. So the question is, aren't you crying too? فَقَالَ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِنِّي لَسْتُ أَبْكِي إِنَّمَا هِيَ رَحْمَةً I'm not crying. In a sense, I'm not crying like you. That's what he's saying. I'm not crying. This is rahmah. This is mercy. إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ بِكُلِّ خَيْرٍ عَلَى كُلِّ حَالٍ The mu'min, whatever he faces, he is facing good. Whatever happens to him, what's happening to him is good. إِنَّ نَفْسَهُ تُنْزَعُ مِنْ بَيْنِ جَنْبَيْنِ وَهُوَ يُحْمَدُ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ His soul is being taken from his body and he's thanking Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's beautiful what he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ بِكُلِّ خَيْرٍ عَلَى كُلِّ حَالٍ Whatever the mu'min is facing, he is facing good from Allah Azza wa Jal, whatever is happening to him. So what did the Prophet do and what did Ayman, Ummu Ayman do and what is the difference between them? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was crying? Yes, right? There were tears coming from his eyes, right? But was there sound with it? Was he crying out loud? No. Ummu Ayman was. So when Ummu Ayman radiallahu anha saw the Prophet ﷺ doing this and then her emotions got the best of her, she, you know, expressed that anxiety with a sound. But the crying of the Prophet ﷺ, they say similar to his laughter with, without a sound. He didn't laugh loud and he didn't cry loud. So he was crying only with tears. So when she, he said, I see you crying. He said, this is not crying, meaning like you're crying. This is rahmah. This is mercy. Because you see in front of you someone who's dying. And they are going typically through some pain. And you are crying because of this. So it's not crying out of anxiety. It's not crying out of rejection of what is happening. And you're not panicking. 
And you're not saying to yourself, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm losing so and so, I'm not going to see so and so. Though these are feelings that you have and may cause you to cry. And it's not haram if these feelings cause you to cry. But that's not why the Prophet ﷺ was crying. He wasn't crying because he was panicky. He wasn't crying because he was upset. He wasn't crying because I lost her and I'm going to miss her. He's not crying because of this. Though these emotions, some of them are natural. But why was he crying at that moment? What, what, what did he call it? Rahman. Rahman. You look at this being, this small girl, right? Or this old man or this old lady and they're going through some pain and you feel that rahma in your heart because you don't want them to experience it. And they're dying and you have this rahma in your heart for them. And that's why the, these tears come down. So that's what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said something that could be a solace and comfort to every person who goes through any type of trouble, especially when you lose someone. In al mu'mina bi kulli khayrin ala kulli hal. Whatever the mu'min is facing, he is good. And she is good. Because it's always good from Allah Azza wa Jal. To the extent that their soul is being taken from their body and there is nothing more painful, nothing more anxious than this. Right? Right? There's nothing more painful or more anxious than that. And it's being taken, care, taken from their body. And what they're doing? Yahmadullah This doesn't happen with any other human. It doesn't happen with... A, a human, you could, you could, they could be the dearest person to you, but if they hurt you, they hurt you. And it's hard to thank them while they're hurting you. But not with Allah Azza wa Allah Azza wa will take it and your love for Allah will be so strong and so solid that it will be, He will be taking your soul, but you will feel the ni'mah. While he's taking your soul, you will feel the ni'mah in that sickness, you will feel the ni'mah of that disaster and affliction. So, whatever is happening to you, Allah is always best for you. And that thing that is happening is best for you. And that is ni'mah from Allah Azza wa to have that conviction, that, that certainty that whatever happens, even the death of my child, that explains it. Why did, would that, why did my child die when they're three, two, five years old? Why did my wife die? Why did you know my father die? Why did my spouse die? Why did this person that I love? And if you find it hard to explain, go back to this hadith and similar hadith and say, what happened to them is the best that could happen to them and the best that could happen to you. In fact, you need to thank and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when that happens. Here we will see um, uh, another tragedy that hit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is a granddaughter, and this is a daughter. And you have a solace and an example in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you say to yourself, um, I've lost a young child, the Prophet lost young children. I lost a daughter or a son, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost them. Right? So you have a solace that he did ex- experience all of these things. So Anas ibn Malik, he says, Shahidna ibn li Rasulillahi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rasulullahi jalisun ala al-qabr. He says, we've witnessed the death of a daughter for the, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah is sitting on the grave. Okay. فَرَأَيْتُ عَيْنَهُ تَدْمَعَانَ وَعَيْنَهُ تَدْمَعَانَ I saw his eyes with tears in them. I mean, on his cheek. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he asked, أَفِيكُمْ رَجُلٌ لَمْ يُقَارِ فِي اللَّيْلَةِ is there a man among you who wasn't intimate with his family tonight? So Abu Talha said, Ana. Qala fanzil, fanazala fi qabriya. So he says, go down to, the, to her grave. And they handed her body to him, radiyallahu anhu. Right? So he asked, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the person who will be fit to be down in the grave and to receive the body. And he made that condition of who wasn't intimate with his family. And among the sahaba, Abu Talha, radiyallahu anhu, was the one who fulfilled that condition. What is important here in this hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ losing his daughter and he's sitting right, right next to her, right? As she's being buried next to the grave and he's crying <coughs> Now, that's the conclusion of this chapter, inshallah. The next is a very short chapter about the bed or the bedding of the Prophet ﷺ who had one hadith in it. Then we'll move on to the humbleness of the Prophet So in this hadith, single hadith in this chapter, Aisha radiallahu anha said, إِنَّمَا كَانَ فِرَاشُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي يَنَامُ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَدَمٍ حَشْوُهُ لِيْفِ 
He says the bedding of the Prophet وسلم, that he would sleep on, think of a mat, something like that. It's made of leather and is stuffed with fibers from the palm tree. This is what his bedding وسلم, was. So what is it made of? Leather. Admin. Leather. And what is it stuffed with? Fiber that you get from the palm tree. Nothing fancy. Was not cotton? Was it what? Not, not, I know. I don't know what is foam or uh, down or whatever, you know, uh, or down, right? I'm sorry, not down, down, right? So whatever it is, it's not what we use today, right? It's something that is very simple. And they say about it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the purpose of it was just to rest and then get over with it and, you know, bounce back to worshiping Allah as though and taking care of your, your responsibility. You don't want it such a bed that you, when you sleep on it, you feel that the bed is not, refuses to release you, right? No, don't leave me. You don't want, not that you shouldn't seek comfort. You can be comfortable, inshallah. But I mean, if it's causing you to miss Fajr and miss Qiyam and miss all of these things, you may, you may, you may want to, you know, uh, toughen up a little bit, you know, and take something a little harsher without hurting your back or hurting your body, inshallah. Also, that's not the objective. But simple. That the bedding of the Prophet ﷺ was very simple. Now we come to this chapter, alhamdulillah, which is about the humbleness of the Prophet ﷺ. It's one of the chapters, inshallah, that, you know, should change us on the inside and the outside, inshallah. Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says لا تطروني كما أطرت النصار ابن مريم إنما أنا عبد فقول عبد الله ورسوله He says do not praise me like the Christians have praised Jesus son of Mary Indeed I'm only a slave So say Abdullah wa rasuluh The slave of Allah and his messenger and it's here, subhanAllah, it is these types of things that tell you and confirm to you that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a prophet of Allah and that he was not a seeker of fame or a seeker of power or a seeker of reputation. Because if you're a seeker of any of these things, what do you say to your followers? Please praise me, right? Write a biography about me, poetry, uh, uh, a statue, uh, a painting, name something after me, is it? That's what you tell them. Immortalize me on this earth. Please don't forget me when I pass away. Immortalize me one way or another. The Prophet ﷺ, what does he say? لا تطروني. Do not praise me. Like they praised him. Because what was he afraid ﷺ? What was the thing that made him afraid? That this is going to lead to exaggerations. And that exaggeration is going to compromise what? The tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jalla. That we have a tendency, by the way, humans and Muslims have actually have violated this command of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the name of loving Muhammad. And they overpraised him to the extent that they made him divine or semi-divine. Yeah? Because when they, if, if people say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was created from divine light, okay, and that divine light had uh, pre-existed before all of creation and all of creation came from it, in a sense, this is a parallel to saying that Isa alayhi salam is the son of God and he's the word and the word created everything. It's like that, it's close to it. It's very close to it. So he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam. he understands very well the tendency of humanity, especially for people, phys phys physical people, visible, in front of you, to exaggerate them so much and elevate them above their deserved status. So he says, be careful, don't overpraise me like they did with Isa alayhi salam until they made him a son of God and God. Innama ana abd, I am only a slave. So when you want to say something about me, what do you say about me? Abdullah wa Rasulullah, the slave of Allah and his messenger. And in fact, if you want to think about it, there is no higher praise for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam than saying these two things. And in the Quran, there is no higher praise for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam than saying these two things. When Allah wants to exalt and honor Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and give him a title, He'll give him either Abdullah or Rasulullah. Why? Because as a Rasul, he fulfilled his message, uh, message of delivering the message to the fullest. And as the Abd, he fulfilled the Ubudiyah, the servitude, being a true slave of Allah to the fullest. See, he was the best slave of Allah and the best messenger of Allah, and that's the highest praise you can give. Huh? So here it's important, inshallah, whether it's in poetry, whether a person is composing or reading poetry, or reading books about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beware of 
um, exaggerating the praise of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the extent that you violate his own message. And that the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should conform to what the Muhammad loved and decided. And we'll see, I'm not going to we'll reach it. Uh, maybe we'll reach it, inshallah, we'll see. There's another hadith that confirms that idea. That the way that you love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the way that he wanted you to love him, not the way you decide to love him. Maybe I'll read it. Let me read it. I'm just skipping a few ahadith. The Sahaba said, لم يكن شخص أحب إليه من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said they did not love any single person more than the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. قال وكانوا إذا رأوه لم يقوموا لما يعلمون من كراهته لذلك and says if they see him coming, they would not stand up for him because they know how much he hates it. See. You know, today, and there was maybe some reasons to do it today, but if someone is coming and you want to honor him and you're sitting down and they're coming, what do, we, what do we usually do? Stand up for them and we greet them and you know, what all of them. So they said, we didn't love anyone more than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning that if they see him, what should they do? Stand up for him, especially he's the Prophet of Allah. And also they love him so much. So expression of this love and that respect, you're going to stand up. But they said, we know how much he hates when we do this, so we would never stand when he comes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's first of all, is tawabu, humility. Because again, if you're an arrogant person, you want everybody to stand. And not only to stand, to keep standing until you sit down. Isn't that what happens with kings? They stand and no one sits until you sit, yes, your honor, and then everybody sits down. Not with the Prophet I don't want anyone to stand. So their love for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not mean that they're going to do something he hates. Sahih? You follow what I'm saying? We know he hates it. I'm not going to do something he hates. If I love him, I'm not going to do something he hates. So I'm going to keep sitting down even though he comes and he walks by us. And I feel I want to stand, but I know that's wrong, so I'm not going to do it. So your love for Muhammad sallallahu also should be observed and practiced the way that Muhammad sallallahu likes it to be practiced. Not the way I and you decide, oh, I love him, so I'm going to do it this way. That doesn't work like that. So, um, and that is typically, and the best thing, and what preserves tawadu for uh, us even today, is that unless you're gonna, subhanAllah, be hugging someone because they're coming, if they're coming, okay, not to stand for them because they're, they've come, but to keep sitting. Unless, unless, the person does not understand this. Like a lot of average, you know, uh, common Muslims, they don't understand that. And if you don't stand for them, suppose you're sitting in a room and you come and then you're not going to stand to greet them. And the, they'll understand from that that you're insulting them. If that's what they'll understand, then stand up and greet them, inshallah. Right? There's nothing wrong with it, inshallah. But if you want to handshake someone, if you want to uh, hug them and you're sitting and they're standing, stand up to do all of this. But if they're going to understand from lack of standing that it means disrespect, Avoid that fitna, avoid that misunderstanding and stand. But remind ourselves and remind everybody else that the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and what preserves tawadu is what? That when you arrive, there is no need to stand. Okay? There is no need to stand. And that is his tawadu sallallahu alayhi wa Let me go back inshaAllah, uh, a couple of hadiths. Yes. Here's um, his, again, an evidence of his humility. A woman comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَقَالَتْ إِنَّ لِي إِلَيْكَ حَاجَةً She comes to him and she says, Ya Prophet of Allah, I need to, you know, I need you to solve an issue for me. I need to talk to you in private. I don't want people to hear what I have to say. فَقَالَ أَجْلِسِي فِي أَيِّ طَرِيقٍ فِي أَيِّ طَرِيقِ الْمَدِينَةِ شِئْتِ أَجْلِسِ إِلَيْكِ He says, pick any road of the roads of Medina you want and I will sit there and listen to you. So a woman comes to the Prophet وسلم, and she wants to share something with him. She has a problem. But she says, I cannot do it while others are listening. So he says what? Not I'm busy. Okay, come back later. He says, I'm not, wait for me there. It's not wait for me there. He says, you pick where you want to sit and I will come there and I'll sit and I will listen to you. And it's a public place. Huh? So that's a solution if it happens. You know, inshallah does not happen often. If it happens that you need to talk, talk to a sister, okay, and she has a complaint and it's not possible to have anybody else or it's something that is private, 
at least if you don't cannot have somebody else with you and that's always the best, at least you'll be in a public place where everybody sees what's happening. So there the Prophet ﷺ was in a tariq, in a road, right, public. Everybody can see it, but they're far enough so no one can hear her secret. And he says, pick, that, pick the place and I will come and sit and listen to your complaint, listen to what you want solved and I will solve it for you, inshallah. So that's again his tawadu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It says about him, you know, part of his uh, habit. Uh, this is weak, but I will share it with you, inshallah, because it's actually, its meaning is accurate. He says, كان رسول الله يعود المرضى. The Prophet ﷺ visits the sick. And he witnesses the funerals. And he rides the donkey. So donkey is not any prestigious animal by any means, right? So it's like a very humble ride. وَيُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الْعَبْدِ And he answers the invitation of the slave. There are other hadiths like that. And he answers the invitation of the slave. وَكَانَ يَوْمَ بَنِي قُرَيْضَ On the day of Bani Qurayda, right, when they fought Bani Qurayda, كَانَ عَلَى حِمَارٍ مَخْطُومٍ بِحَبْلٍ مِّن دِيفٍ وَعَلَيْهِ إِكَافٌ مِّن دِيفٍ He was riding a donkey, and the rain of the donkey was made of the fibers of the palm tree, and was sitting on a saddle, and the saddle was also made from the same material. So he's telling you here that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if someone, he hears that someone is sick, what does he do? Visits. If there's a funeral, what does he do? Follows. And if he's invited, and the invitation is coming from who? Slave. Or what does a slave have to give? What does a slave have to give? Nothing, almost nothing. But he says, even if a slave is going to invite him, he accepts the invitation of a slave. And his... Ride on the day of Banu Quraida was the humblest thing. Not pretentious, not expensive in any way. And that is his tawadu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by the way, if you are a person who finds that he or she has arrogance in their heart, doing these things, inshallah, eliminates that arrogance. Uh, helping others, visiting the sick, uh, going to the funeral, um, seeking... Um, and subhanAllah, not seeking the, more, the most expensive of clothing, but medium or humble clothing and humble rights. All this breaks that arrogance in your heart. So this is one way to treat it, is that you're not seeking the best of the best, because when you have that, at times it can influence you and your manners. Now see to the extent of it, right? See the extent of his humility, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ يُدْعَى إِلَىٰ خُبْزِ الشَّعِيرِ وَالْإِهَادَةِ السَّنِيْخَ فَيُجِيبُ the Prophet ﷺ would be invited to a meal. I guarantee you, if any of us is invited to that meal, you're not going to eat it. He's being invited to a meal that is made, made of barley bread and fat that has changed in taste and smell because it's old. Meaning what? What are you eating? You have fat, grease, leftover grease, right? And that grease is old. Now when you're going to smell it, it's, it's changed. It's not rotten, right? It's not, it didn't go bad. But it's just that it's old and the taste is old. So you have this bread and you have that grease. And he's invited for that meal. And what does he do? He accepts. Right? What do you accept? And see, he said no. Yeah, no. I'm not going to go. He said, what kind of food is this? I'm not going to go. وَلَقَدْ كَانَ لَهُ دِرْعٌ عِنْدَ فَمَا وَجَدَ مَا يَفُكُّهَا حَتَّى مَا And he had an armor that he had pawned with a Jewish man. And he could not find enough money to tie it back until his death, sallallahu alayhi wa So his armor was pond. Why was it pond? Because he needed to buy barley. And he didn't have enough money to buy barley. So he went and gave it to him and took money from him in exchange. Hoping that it can stay with him as uh, a deposit. And then later the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa can come and buy it back. Till his death, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't find enough money to go back and buy his armor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, why did he go to him and not go to another sahabi? Why do you think? He went to a Jewish man. Why did he go to another sahabi? Huh? Because they, they will never take anything from him. He said, what, you need food? Here. Right? But he didn't want that. Right? He didn't want that. He, he didn't want to burden them. He didn't want to take anything from them. So where did he go? He said, okay, I'm going to go to this Jewish man. He's not going to give me any of these things for free. He has no reason. So here, here's my armor. Give me money back so I can buy food, barley, sha'ir for my family. And he said till his death, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he couldn't buy it back. And the one he bought it back after his death is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He found out about it. He bought it back from that person. 
So, again, this is how simple he lived. Simple. Very, very, very simple. Uh, simple in the invitations he accepted, simple in the food that he ate, simple in his life needs. He had something, he didn't make a big deal out of it. Oh, I need money and I'm the Prophet of Allah and these people are rich and there is this money and, and this person comes to me and he needs money and, and he gives it to him وسلم, and leaves himself in need. He didn't complain about any of this, no. That didn't mean nothing to him. All this money meant nothing to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, Inshallah, I think we'll stop here. Yes, inshallah, we'll stop here. Inshallah. So the chapter is not done. This is one of you know, the chapters, subhanAllah, that I really love in this book, and I hope, inshallah, that you, you find benefit in it. But of course, before we leave, um, if you're ready for the monthly quiz, uh, inshallah, I am ready for it. Inshallah. So do you have your papers and you have your pens and pencils and. And we're not forming study groups, right, to answer these questions, or we're not uh, relying on Google also to find the answer. Either you have it or you don't, inshallah, right? Either you have it or you don't, alhamdulillah. So ready? One, two, three? Okay, inshallah. So question four, uh, 17 and under, inshallah. So the, the first question is for 17 and under. So other than the month of Ramadan, what month did the Prophet ﷺ fast the most? Don't answer, not in public. Okay, if you know it, write it down, inshallah. Other than the month of Ramadan, what month did the Prophet ﷺ fast the most? Don't forget to write your name, inshallah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So one more time, inshallah. Other than the month of Ramadan, what month did the Prophet ﷺ fast the most? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it again, inshallah, before we leave. Now, so this is for yeah, this is for um, 18 and above, inshallah. That's a little more difficult, but it's not really that difficult anyway. So, so the last person who enters heaven, what will Allah give them? What will they have in Jannah? For the last person who enters heaven, what will Allah give them in Jannah? Okay. That's easy, right? I think it's easy. Where's your paper? <laughs> okay. Inshallah. And then for the online question, that's, a, that, that's also sort of easy, inshallah. So what was the reason the Prophet ﷺ gave for praying for rak'as after zawal? After the sun moves away from its zenith. Before praying Dhuhr, the Prophet ﷺ would pray for rak'az. What reason did he give for that? When they asked him, why are we praying those four rak'az? So why did the Prophet ﷺ pray them? What reason did he give? So repeat all the questions again, inshallah, for 17 and under. Other than Ramadan, what month did the Prophet ﷺ fast the most? Uh, for 18 and above, the last person to enter heaven, what will they have in it? What will Allah give them? And for online, which should be answered, inshallah, in the comment section. What was the reason that the Prophet ﷺ gave for praying for rak'az after zawal, which is before Buhur? And let's see, inshallah, if you have any, if you have questions. Yes. Okay. No, no. 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 So how do you compare the two? Very it is Isa making uh saying Oh Allah, if you, if you uh, punish them, their creation, 
And if you forgive them, you have the quality of forgiveness. No. But here, he's, he's being emotional, the fact that he has to be a witness. So, what is the significance on this side, on the earlier narration? The fact that he's repeating, is it because he knows that that's, that's something he'll be asked? Now, that is on the Day of Judgment, uh, the, the ayah that he's repeating, uh, So why was he repeating it uh, so much at that time? Okay, inshallah. So the, the Prophet وسلم, you know, one of the things that worried him is the fate of this ummah and the fate of his followers. So obviously he felt that on the Day of Judgment, you know, subhanAllah, you know, the only power he has is the power of conveying the message, but he has no power of actually guiding people into Jannah or taking them away from hellfire unless Allah Azza wa accepts it. So that's why he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would, would recite this ayah Allahu Alam. And please let me know if I'm really, I haven't answered your question. But this is why he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would kept reciting this ayah out of fear and hope. Out of fear on the one hand that they be punished, but also out of hope at the same time that Allah has the power and has the wisdom and He could rescue them from Jannah. So it is this fear and hope from Allah Azza wa Jal that made him keep repeating this ayah, all built on the foundation of the um, care that he had and um, subhanAllah, the worry, how, how worried he was for the ummah. So this is, this is the reason why he was repeating it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the other one, in the eclipse, right? Refer, referencing the other one during the eclipse. Oh, now, for him being a witness, again, I think it's uh, there recalling the, um, the gravity of, and the seriousness of that day. And that when you're witnessing against someone, it's not easy because this person is being condemned because they disobeyed Allah Azza wa Jal. And maybe the gravity of that witness, of that witnessing as well, because here all of humanity, and here Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being, in effect, a witness for and against all of humanity. So this is something that, in a sense, um, brings on an honor that he could be so thankful for it that he is crying and at the same time such responsibility that Allah is raising you to this level where you're witnessing for Ibrahim and Nuh and Isa and Musa alayhi salatu wa salam ajma'een and by extension also all of humanity. So you're seeing at that time people going to Jannah and going to hellfire and you just can't but, you know, you know shed some tears. So I hope I answered it inshallah. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'm taking you back to the incident when the Prophet lost the dog. No. And he was sitting by the bedside. No. He just said there was a question he asked the Sahabis before he took the one. He went to the bedside. What was that question he asked? Aayyukum lam yuqari fi layla. Which among you did not, was not intimate with his wife tonight? So Abu Talha said, I. So I mean, I did not. You know, he was not intimate with that, with her tonight. So he said, you go down and you handle, and you receive the body. So it tells you that when you're bearing a, a, a woman, inshallah, that's one of the things. It's like the scholars say, probably recommended, Allahu A'lam, probably recommended, that a person who would handle that would not have slept, you know, with his wife uh, that, the night before. No, the night before. Allah. Yeah. Okay. طيب جزاكم الله خيرا إن شاء الله we'll see you next week يا يا please oh okay about the question from last Friday so brother, the brother asked جزاكم uh, خير he said um, do you pray the sunnah right do you pray the sunnah after the adhan or can you pray the sunnah uh, after the time comes in so the, his question uh, specifically was so the time of dhuhr let's say the time of dhuhr comes in let's say that when is the time of dhuhr 12.10. So let's say 12.10 is the time for Dhuhr. The masjid prays at what time? 1. So maybe the Adhan is being called 12.45. So a person comes at let's say 12.30, 12.35, the Adhan is not being called. But it's already time for Dhuhr. Do you pray or can you pray Sunnah to Dhuhr at that time or do you have to wait for the Adhan? No, Allah A'lam, you can pray Sunnah to Dhuhr at that time. Why? Because the time of Dhuhr has already come. The Adhan is for the announcement for the Salah. The Adhan is for the announcement of the Salah. But Sunnah al-Dhuhr is available to you once the time of Dhuhr comes in. 
If the dan is being called exactly at the time of Dhuhr, obviously you cannot pray before, because the time of Dhuhr has not arrived. But if there is delay, then you can pray within that time, because what? It's time for Dhuhr, inshallah. There's no problem. The only sunnah that you will need to reserve for after the adhan, the sunnah between adhan and iqam. So that sunnah has to, of course, be between adhan and iqam. But Dhuhr, for instance, or the Asr, or um, Fajr, it does not have to be after the Adhan if the time has actually come. Yeah. So you can pray before So you can pray before Sahih. Sahih, So you can pray if you have time. You can pray Sunnah al for instance, at home before you come to the Masjid. And then you come to the Masjid and then you will not be praying it. Thank you. 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 Thank